Welcome to Loud in Action, where once again I am joined by Dave Brown, uh, author uh, and game designer of O Group, the uh, World War II battalion level rules uh, that are being published by Riser Express. And uh, we're here today, Dave, to continue our conversation about, about O Group, obviously, and walking our way through the various phases of the game. So in the last discussion we had, we talked very much about what type of forces uh, O Group covers. We talked yeah. about um, things like setting up a battlefield. Uh, we talked about what people would need. Um, what I'd like to do today is say, right, we've got our army, we've got our battlefield set up, we've got our D6, we've got our tape measure, we've got yeah. our party hat on and our, our lucky underpants. So we're all ready to go. Um, Let's talk about deploying troops onto onto the tabletop because you know we we can both remember the days when you know if you were deploying troops in a World War II game you'd start on your table edge I'd start on mine and in many ways um, yeah. it, you know it's the same deployment setup as if you were fielding Napoleonic forces or Dark Age forces or ancient forces we all had a table edge and that's where we all started and everybody advanced to battle. Um, but I think um, rules generally have moved away from that and there's a lot more of a nod towards the concept of the empty battlefield. Yeah. Um, uh, but also, you know, the idea that you don't have to have deploy your troops on the table or, or, all at one go. I mean, I, I know when we first brought out Chain of Command, a lot of people thought that the command dice, rolling command dice to deploy on the table was a mechanism designed to hamper them and delay the arrival of their troops when in fact what it was was just representing the fact that you, you don't need to deploy them on the table you simply bring them on where you need them when you need them um, yeah. so can we talk about how let's go really to the starting point we've got our table set up i've got my army on a magic tray ready to go um, how do we go about getting the game started do i put my troops on the table or or what how does it work you tell me yeah i mean that's uh, uh you, you make some good points so what i wanted to try and uh, avoid uh was exactly what you've uh touched upon was having uh all your troops on the table at the start uh and perhaps if i refer refer us back to the uh, that arnhem game game i played uh all my um uh, parachute brigade units were <laughs> on the table at the start. Mm. And as they approached Arnhem, the German player had a, a nice view of my uh, approach route and he could plan accordingly. He probably had about five or six turns to get nicely sorted. And what I wanted to avoid uh, was that kind of situation. So I think it was probably very rare that any World War II commander had such a glorious oversight of the battlefield. That's interesting you saying that, actually, because I had a very similar experience at the World War II Holiday Centre many years ago with Peter Gilder. And uh, that was a game um, we were running in Normandy. And uh, I had a uh, force of armour, which was due to be arriving on the, the flank of the German position. And as it did, it advanced across the table and below me down um, the... Uh, the enemy's anti-tank guns were all sat there in the hedgerow and I could see where they were. And of course, uh, with a, whatever the range was, 24 inch range, at 25 inches, I turned right and outflanked their position. And it was, like, <laughs> it was one of those things that I felt at the time, they shouldn't have known I was coming and I certainly shouldn't have known where they were. Um, yes. And that, that, that does present issues in games when you've got too much information, doesn't it? In terms of in terms of making you respond and act in a manner that a, a commander would, because of course they wouldn't have that helicopter general uh, vision. So yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's right. I mean, it's even to the extent I know uh, a lot of rules have tried to overcome that with uh, spotting dice or spotting tables and spotting mechanisms, but that still doesn't <laughs> overcome the issue that the player knows the, where those anti-tank guns are yeah. and therefore even if his troops haven't spotted them he still does exactly as you do swerves yeah. off to the left or the right mm -hmm. uh, and it just makes a bit of a mockery of it mm. um it, it it highlights one of the issues that um i uncovered during the sort of design of it is the fact that 
try any in any game I've played in the past, trying to move anti-tank guns forward or deploy guns in kind of mid battle was virtually a uh, tantamount to suicide because mm. the defender or your opponent could easily spot where they came on. And as they were being towed, you just mortared them or, or, you know, blew the proverbials out of them on their way up. And, but it, that was in contrast to the amount of times I've read in various accounts that uh, anti-tank guns, even if they weren't pre-deployed, they would surprise people by their appearance on the battlefield. Mm. Uh, the opponent wouldn't know always where they were. And e even situations where guns would be uh, rolled up into the front line in the middle of the fighting, and they still weren't observed until they started opening fire. I mean, some yeah. of the classic ones are those, you can even see the videos of Germans and Russians using heavy howitzers in the middle of uh, Berlin or Stalingrad. Yeah. Now, if that was a traditional war game, there's no way you'd ever get that um, light gun carriage uh, to that position because the opponent would just blow it to pieces. Mm. But clearly, surprise was an element. So that was a, a, a key fundamental uh, in deploying troops onto the table uh, and obviously trying to maintain that empty battlefield uh, feeling to it. OK, so how would I deploy troops onto the table or do we even start the game by deploying troops onto the table how does the game begin uh, the game deployment method is based on a set of dice rolls mm -hmm. and rather interestingly these are called the battalion deployment dice rolls huh. and it's their corresponding scores indicates the nature or the stance of your initial battalion deployment so uh, i would roll yep these dice what would i roll one per unit or how would that it's work? what I've, I've i've done is try to keep it in parallel to the command dice that you use every turn so it's fair, fairly straightforward so in effect a uh, standard size uh, battalion mm -hmm. would roll both players attacking and defending would roll nine dice okay. and the results of those scores indicates uh, the state of your um, advanced positions so, okay. if perhaps, yeah, do you want to roll some dice, Richard, and tell yeah, me what yes. you get, and then perhaps it, we can go through them? It's funny you should say that, because I've just picked up a handful of nine dice with you mentioning that. Well done. And I've just been playing a game with some friends down in Melbourne in Australia, so I've got my dice to hand. And what I'm going to do is, is put them through this luxury uh, Two Fat Lardy's dice tower and see what results... We get, right, okay. Well, that was incredibly smooth. That fabulous dice action was great. <laughs> right, now I don't know what I need here, but I'll start at the very beginning. One, one, two, two, three, four, six, five, six, six. Okay, so let's take that as the defender's role because the mm. defender goes first and sets okay. up first. All so right. what I'll do is I'll take it uh, mm. from the top and work mm. work down right let's go so scores for the defender of six and five yeah I've got three of them. lovely so you've got three mm -hmm. uh, ambush units that you can deploy straight away onto the table okay so uh, i'll make a note and, of that three ambush. yeah so yeah. take that make a note of that uh, please corporal so yeah. a an ambush unit um is a unit that uh, the player decides to have as uh, hidden yeah. uh, behind his forward defensive line uh, in a terrain feature. So he so could I, have... I could yeah. have him in a church or in a wood or... C yeah. Correct. So you would choose either maybe an infantry platoon, uh, an MMG, uh, anti-tank section, maybe a platoon of anti-tank guns, mm. or maybe even tanks. Um, they are deployed in a uh, suitable... Uh, situation of cover so that could be as you say woods etc um, and e even um, uh, buildings church towers but obviously what we couldn't have is say uh, a unit of tiger tanks in ambush in a cabbage patch what, what you would do is you would simply note down yeah uh, in what terrain a piece they are in right so you don't need to write down the facing or anything like that that's down to your uh, platoon commanders etc and they'll get that right hopefully uh, when they deploy 
No. So, so I could just go MMG in the church tower. And when I deploy, presumably I spring my ambush, I can Correct. then decide whether I'm firing north, south, east or west. Yes, that's the, yeah, absolutely. That's the benefit of being in ambush, yeah. is that when you decide to deploy them, mm. they can deploy to the facing of their choice. Right. Okay. And as we touched on uh, in the last discussion, we've got those built up areas uh, and that's, that's a nice little advantage. It just means they work themselves into the right position. So what do the rest of the dice do? So uh, in a, the only thing I'll add to that is in addition, Mm -hmm. uh, you can uh, anything that you have uh, in your setup that is a um, a heavy gun, which means something like a you know a pack forty or um, maybe a seventeen pounder, mm -hmm. or anything that's um, manning a bunker or dugout or similar, can also be placed in ambush in addition to those dice rolls. So if you've okay. got a series of fortifications, right. They can be manned with ambush units so that the attacker doesn't know what in the bunker or, or where your heavy guns are. But they're assumed to be deployed before the battle and, and in ready positions. Okay. So, yeah, so if we move on, mm -hmm. the, the scores, uh, corresponding scores of uh, four, three and two, they all represent your combat patrols. Okay, I've got four of them. Yeah, so... <laughs> Those are your forward uh, scouts who've gone to take up uh, advanced positions to deploy their platoons uh, at, at a later point uh, in the game. These can be your normally your company reserves. Uh, uh, and we can touch on combat patrols, if you like, in a bit more detail yeah. later on. Yeah, we'll come back to them. But I've made a note, so I've got three ambushes. I've got four combat patrols. What am I... What do my two ones allow me to do? Don't right, I? your two ones, ones for both players, uh, represent the effect of the opening barrage. Okay. Uh, unless you're playing a very specific scenario, we assume that in a game that most attacks started with an opening barrage of some kind. So it could be mortars or it could be artillery or whatever, but uh, some kind of stonk has been put in. Correct. And, and it just represents, I guess, any disruption on the way to the battlefield or... Any troops yeah, who've been that's it. Out. So, so actually, um, what's happening then is that the battle is starting as though yes. stuff has happened beforehand, which is an interesting perspective. Yeah. So it's a, it's about what your current battalion uh, situation is. Uh, ones for the um, defender represents the interdiction of of his reserves, and as we'll see in a minute, ones for the attacker represents uh, casualties that he's inflicted. Right. So. Ones from both players will indicate the kind of situation of the defender's battalion. All right, so I've got a, a brace of them. Two ones, what does that do to me as that, the defender? As the defender, that means you have two turns of interdiction of your reserves. So when, when you're trying to deploy your units onto combat patrols, yeah. um, the uh, opposing player gets to roll to see if you actually manage to deploy so you, there's a basically a 50-50 dice roll. Do your guys uh, get up there and get into the position on time? Or have they been delayed because of the uh, pre-game stomp that's gone in uh, and they don't, they don't get there? All so right. it's a delaying action. Okay, so that then uh, does what? How do I then start the game? So I make a note of my three ambushes, machine yep. in the church tower, Tiger tanks in the orchard. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, you then, you then uh, with your combat patrols, you assign yeah. them to each uh, company uh, commander that you've got uh, uh, on table. So yeah. the company commanders go down in their uh, particular sectors. So, right. so we discussed in the last game, you were going to be attacking, uh, when we saw your game uh, uh, on the Russian front that you were playing, you were having one company on the company. left and one company on the right. Yeah. So um, you would allocate, in this case, well, you're an attacker there, but were you the defender, you could allocate a couple of combat patrols. You put your, you put your company yes. headquarters on the table. Yeah. And, and, and then, then allocate you put your combat patrols. Correct. And then allocate them to them. So if you were the Russian, yeah. you could, let's say, you could allocate two combat patrols for each company because the yeah. Russian player's got two companies up on yeah. the table and one back yeah. so those combat patrols are uh, assigned to a company yeah 
and he can deploy, deploy those combat patrols anywhere in his company sector uh, behind his forward defensive line. Right. And your forward defensive line can be anything that the scenario sets or generally in game turns, it's about um, very roughly two thirds uh, the way up the table. So you've got a fair bit of ground in which to deploy them. Deploy that. Okay. And then uh, the interdiction's obvious, that's happened. I'm the yep. defender, I've got two turns in which uh, my reserves are going to find it harder to deploy out. Now, you've been, yep. we've been talking about that as the defender. What happened if I spun that round and we had exactly the same dice rolls, but you were the attacker? What would they mean then? Would they mean the same thing? Obviously, the ones wouldn't. What would it mean? No, it's, it changes slightly. So um, scores of sixes and fives mm. uh, represent units that you can deploy uh, on the table straight away behind your start line. Okay. Now, the start line is always considered to be only just into the table, so it's basically a foot 12 inches in, right. and you can deploy units um, anywhere in that start line. Again, it's based on which company you want, so you put your two company commanders down, if you will, um, as I'm doing, I'm playing the Germans, I've got one company and two company, I can decide where to deploy those up front units they represent um platoons or, or sections that have already stepped off the start line or stepped off from their forming up points and they've uh, they're either bang on schedule or even ahead of schedule so they're right. your guys that are on the table so with these with the roles i got five six six i could deploy three platoons on the table but from, from one of my company yeah units. correct so i yeah, could that... use the I could choose to have them all from the left-hand company, all arrived on time, and the right-hand company, it's presumably a bit riskier. They haven't, they're not ahead of time. Correct, uh, or they're holding or, back. Or, and yes. so I could do two and one or three and whatever. Yeah, absolutely. You choose, you choose which company gets what. Right. And what so, about then? What about I two, two, three, and four? Yes, your your four, three, two, they represent exactly the same thing. So that's combat patrols. Right. And can I deploy them forward ahead of my yeah, they, they are again deployed behind your start line. You right. allocate them to the company of your choice mm -hmm. and, and you put them down. So again, if I was the, uh, as I am the German in that, uh, in our Operation Barbarossa scenario, I'm probably going to go for two combat patrols uh, with each company to start off with. But again, you could do three and one or four and none or two and two. Well, the maximum a company commander can ever get out in his mm -hmm. sector is three. Right. So basically, it's one per, per infantry platoon. Yeah. So, um, I, yeah, I mean, I could certainly do three for one, say, maybe one company and just uh, have one uh, tucked over with two company. OK. And then the ones? That right. The ones. Okay. Yeah. Ones, uh, again, are linked to the opening um, barrage. Uh, and ones are good uh, for me as the attacker because they represent the casualties or the casualty level that I've inflicted upon your battalion. Uh, again, with my opening uh, barrage. So um, the more ones you get, uh, the more impact you have on the defending battalion. So right. uh, a single one would remove uh, one infantry platoon. Mm. Uh, uh, an additional one has an impact upon your available headquarters um, orders at the start of the game, because we both start off with a, a set number. And a third one would remove uh, a section from your supports, an additional section. So the more ones represents the more disruption or casualties to the defender's battalion. OK, so let's imagine this imaginary table that we're playing on. So yeah. I, we, we both happen to have rolled exactly the same hand. So I'm starting off with three groups in ambush because I'm the defender. Yeah. I've got four patrols that I've pushed forward because I presume there's an advantage to pushing them forward yeah. to hold yeah. you up and, and presumably we've touched on this before, they're going to be points of threat that you're potentially going to have to respond to. But yeah. I've also got those two ones, which means that deploying forces is going to be slightly hampered for the first couple of turns. Correct. You, on the other hand, have also uh, knocked out one of my platoons and reduced the number of orders in my uh, with my HQ by one. So the interdiction yeah. has been hitting my troops, but also affecting my HQ. Yeah, yeah. And you've got <clears throat> three units on the table, whatever they are. Yeah. And you've got four combat patrols 
that yes. are, are going to be you're going to be using to move up. So actually, the result looks quite different. Um, yes. Uh, yeah. But I, you know, I can see that in my mind's eye in terms of the way that is going to set up. And we put those we put those troops on the table. Or more to the point, you put your troops on the table. I'm still presenting you at this stage with an empty battlefield, other than a few patrol markers, aren't I? Yes, because when you, when, when, uh, as the German attacker uh, against these Russian positions, when I look across the table, there's not a single defending unit actually on. Right. So, yeah. uh, again, I gain no information and certainly no intelligence from the picture. Uh, right. I know where the combat patrols are, so there's a, a rough guess there as to where they might deploy. But of course, as we'll touch on, combat patrols are mobile. They can move. Yeah. Uh, and I know he'll have some ambush units. Um, so I've, I know he'll have three. That's just part of the war game. But actually, I don't know if it's a war game where we've, say, had secret um, uh, use of points or secret orbats. I also don't know what heavy guns he might have. Or right. I don't know if he's got bunkers or dugouts. I don't know what will be holding those positions. Right. And that could be more, as we've touched on, that could be more ambush points. So it really yeah. does, it really does present you with the empty battlefield and and hence, I guess, the patrol mechanism, because you're going to be going forward in a relatively circumspect manner. But let's talk now about uh, so we've set that up. What happens next in the game, David? What do we do next? So if you uh, imagine that's the uh, initial dice rolls. So all the rest of your units are in reserve. So the, one, the units that have been allocated the, to the battalion reserve, well, they can sit there separate. But all the rest of the other troops are your company reserves. Mm -hmm. And the company commanders can deploy those either onto the uh, table edge using the kind of classic war games deployment style yeah. or they can deploy them using their combat patrols or they can deploy them using consolidation as we've touched on um, in the following turns so as the battle develops more and more units will deploy onto the table if the player wishes to do so um, a defender could could play a kind of risky strategy and maybe he's content with the number of ambush units he's got and just deploy more combat patrols and, and have go for more of a deployment and probing defence. But normally, you'll start to deploy fairly quickly off your combat patrols to firm up your defensive line. OK, so there is an issue here that this ties in with command and control, but I really want to discuss command and control in more detail in the uh, in the next program in this series because i yeah. think it's uh, uh it's good to to focus on one area of the rules at a time um but uh so can you explain to me how combat patrols work because i think we all understand how an ambush works i will deploy because i've already made a note of where they are i think um uh, people will understand the idea of me arriving on the table edge because we've all been doing that for a <laughs> yep. while wargaming career. I want to talk about the other two that, that sound more interesting. The, the patrols, the combat patrols that you're using and consolidation. But let's talk about combat patrols first of all. Tell me about these, David. How do they work? What do they look like? Right, okay. They are... Uh basically a war games mechanism covering the actions of small fighting patrols of infantry or scouts making their way forward to advanced positions on the battlefield. So uh, what they basically do is they're pushed out by the company commander um, or the your platoon commander to advance positions so that the rest of the platoon can then deploy on that position. Um, it's the classic stuff if anyone uh, again who's uh, uh, had the misfortune to wear uh, green and been in an infantry unit um, forward recon patrols that go forward take up an advanced position and then go and fetch the rest of the platoon mm. are in fact what combat patrols are doing um, so their role once they've uh, got to their, their desired position is to deploy infantry or even possibly light guns and reconnaissance units 
onto the table in that position. Okay. So, uh, what, what do they look like? Uh, they can be any marker that you want. Um, so you could use, um, I, I think some, someone I mentioned on the um, O Group fo Facebook page that he was going to use from his 50 mil collection uh, for chain of command, he was going to use uh, junior leaders and senior leaders, kind of single figures yeah. as combat patrols. So you could use, they could be figures, they can be markers or, or anything you like, as long as it's not, um, you know, as long as they're not too large, mm. to represent a patrol that's going forward. Mm. And so then you, you could actually, you could use a marker like the patrol marker in chain of command, for example, or you could use figures on a base that are painted yep. to look like sneaky beaky scouts going forward. Yeah, yep. that's exactly what they are. So, so it, you could you can use anything you like, um, it, literally from a, a cut out bit of paper or, or straight through to a nice vignette um style mo model mm. so now these begin if, if if i'm the attacker these begin pretty much on my start line yeah how, how do i activate these uh, I, I, so there are two yes here, but... there are two two ways to um to activate if you like uh, combat patrols first of all you can give them uh, an order out of your uh, available order part of the pile to move so right. you can keep them moving forward right. or push them to the left or the right, wherever you want to yeah. go. Um, or the company commander, mm. uh, again, by using orders, is able to deploy more. Right. But he, he's limited to the three. Right. So you can never have three in his sector. Mm. But if he deploys a, a unit from a combat patrol, that combat patrol then is returned to the reserve, so it becomes available to him again to deploy later in the game if he wishes to do so. Right. Okay. So it's um, in a way, it's a bit like a Napoleonic general have a certain number of ADCs who he can use to run about the battlefield. But uh, and when they come back, you can use them again. So you you can always send out uh, patrols, and presumably, uh, I say presumably because obviously we play a number yeah. of games and I know this, but you can use combat patrols either to as a means of deploying troops forward, but also just as a means of harassing your enemy and uh, trying to cover your own flanks sometimes by moving them out there because people can't just ignore them, can they? That That's correct. So if you think, uh, if you spot an area of the battlefield that you think is a weak flank or maybe even an open flank, you can push your combat patrols deeper and deeper into that area. Uh, and basically, is the opponent, if you don't counter them, either with your own combat patrols, which basically closes them down, or with uh, units or through recon or firing at them, then what you're allowing your opponent to do is to infiltrate your position to a greater and greater depth. Okay. So you can never... <laughs> Um, rest easy if the opponent has combat patrols moving in an area of the battlefield. And that's interesting from a game design point of view because if you, if you look at something like I Ain't Been Shot Man, which uses a, sort of a, set of, a system of blinds, which, uh, um, <clears throat> which you have a set number to represent your forces, they move forward, but that tends to be an early facet aspect of the game because as things get deployed, you, you have less and less blinds. But in, uh, in O Group, with combat patrols, you know, you've always got that capacity to be sending patrols out in order to uh, try and dominate that battlefield. So in a way, it's, it's, um, it's, replicating, uh, it's replicating the importance of um, controlling the battlefield, controlling the empty spaces on the battlefield. Isn't yeah, yeah, that's it. And, and as the battle develops, um, the player or the company commander is going to have to make more and more choices about how he uses his orders. So is he, uh, as the battle goes on, going to concentrate on perhaps on table units uh, to fire and rally and move? Or is he perhaps going to concentrate a bit more on combat patrols? And he's always going to have a decision do I deploy another combat patrol? Do I try and exploit this area? Or do I perhaps abandon the probing and scouting for the next couple of turns until the situation changes? 
Right. And if the situation changes, then obviously the player has the ability to place uh, more combat patrols down and try and exploit the situation. I would imagine that it's a, it's a system that allows you to shift your centre of gravity if the enemy has been so foolish to say, well, I'm, I'm going to ignore them because they're just cardboard tokens. I'll focus on combating those real figures over there. And then all of a sudden you've, you've shifted your centre of gravity as maybe a whole company is turning, turning up somewhere where they hadn't expected. So yes. it does mean that you've got to be very aware of um are very aware of your enemy's patrols because they they are an area of opportunity that they can exploit yeah and it also gives uh the player an opportunity to deploy light guns and light anti-tank guns also from combat patrols and okay. therefore gives the uh, ability in a war game actually to use anti-tank guns to ambush uh, in inverted commas yeah. um yeah other units so mm. tanks rumbling over the table mm. can never be confident that they won't get hit by anti-tank guns if mm. the opponent has got combat patrols um scattered about the battlefield because he will never know if one of these might um uh, deploy a com uh, a uh, an anti-tank gun or an anti-tank rifle or even a, a later war kind of piat team or whatever you have to be extremely careful Tanks? Can you deploy tanks from combat patrols? Presumably. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned that. The answer's no. Yes. <laughs> right. Tanks tend to be big, heavy, noisy and clumbersome and are not very good at the sneaky beaky stuff. Leaping so, brushes, yeah. yeah, you've got so tanks and heavy guns hmm. cannot deploy off combat patrols. They're always coming on uh, on the table edge or on a, a road entry point wherever you want. Right. OK, that makes sense to me. Um, is it pertinent at this point or maybe, you know, you might decide that we want to leave this for, uh, to another programme on, on combat, maybe. But is it pertinent to, to ask, how do I overcome my enemy's combat patrols without yeah. going into without going? You know, if that involves combat, we don't need, we'll wait until the combat thing. But tell us in broad terms. Yeah, I'll just yeah, cover it in brief. There's, hmm. How, the three ways of removing uh, enemy combat patrols that are obviously annoying you as a player. Yeah. First of all, uh, you can use reconnaissance units to basically recon them. Right. So you can counter enemy combat patrols by your reconnaissance units. Right. If you get a, a successful reconnaissance action, uh, the combat, the opposing combat patrol is removed from play and placed back in reserves. Right. You can simply see that as either the combat patrol has been spooked by the presence of uh, enemy recon and bugged out, or maybe they've had a few rounds put down and they've definitely bugged out and gone back um, to RV with the main patrol or main platoon. Uh, the second one is that uh, is basically by, by being attacked, which we'll cover later. So units can either recon by, by far, which effectively means shooting at a combat patrol. So you're driving or, up an enemy patrol by firing at it. Yeah, exactly. So maybe you've spotted some some dubious looking characters poking their heads up 100 yards away and you, you get your, uh, your your teams to lay down a bit of fire in that area to, to soften it up. Or, of course, if they come under an artillery attack, there's a chance the, they'll, uh, again, bug out. Or, of course, the final and perhaps the most direct method mm -hmm is you just move over them. So right. um, you could imagine your couple of guys hunkered down in the in the ditch, getting ready to move up the, the platoon. They stick their heads up and suddenly there's 30 Russians moving towards them. Right. They're going to leave pretty quickly. Okay. So that is uh, effectively uh, how they're removed. Uh, and obviously the only thing we haven't touched on is when they deploy their patrol or uh, sorry, platoon or unit, the combat patrol is also removed from play. OK, fine. So they've done their job. Our work here is done and uh, the force that's taking over from them is deployed on yeah. the table. All right, good. So so it's uh, it's an opportunity to threaten. It's an opportunity to exploit gaps, but they can be countered. But obviously you're using resources to counter something that might not be anything, but might be something. But that that does present you as a commander with certain, you know, command challenges. That you've yeah. Money, can't they? Um, yeah, exactly. Okay. Now, consolidation. 
Yeah. Let's talk about that because this is this is a concept that I really like, and the and and the idea of phase lines and objectives. How how well? Just tell me about consolidation, David. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it consolidation came out of the, the fact, isn't it, that um, that we've touched on earlier in the conversation that deploying reserves uh, in a war game was often a detriment and not an advantage. Yeah. Whereas in virtually every single battle account I've ever read, literally from um, the ancient Roman period all the way through Napoleon's to World War II, deploying a reserve was a benefit to the commander and a significant benefit. Yeah. So part of the game design was to go, right, if we're deploying reserves uh, through consolidation, that needs to be a benefit to the player uh, and he wants to be able to do that. So um, if you've recorded the last uh, uh, podcast and video, uh, as the German uh, forces in our Russian front scenario, I've held back um, three company mm -hmm. um, as the battalion reserve, and I've indicated two um, village areas uh, over on um, my left flank yeah. uh, that will be the consolidation points. So... Now when, I noticed that. Can you tell us? Can you tell us what you mean by that? Because uh... yeah, so uh, basically that's the phase line objective for the initial company that's deployed on the table. So two companies deployed in that sector, and they will push forward in order to capture those objectives. Uh, once they've captured them, I then, as the battalion commander, have the option to consolidate on that objective position. Um, if, As it's a pre-planned uh, objective position, the order cost to the player is, is cheap. Yeah. Uh, and that allows me to deploy on that position uh, my reserve infantry company commander and a couple of combat patrols. So immediately you're starting to deploy your reserve company in that position. Right, and that's, you say that's cheap to do. Obviously, I don't want to get into the mechanism yeah. of the command and control yet, but potentially you've, you're tying the cheapness of that as a command, as a command ability, that, and that's relatively easy because that's the phase line that they were assigned yeah. at the start of the battle. Yes, correct. So, so, so correct. naming those villages, your consolidation points, sets them up, as but basically that's your plan when we yeah. talked about you don't need reams and reams of pages by naming those places as consolidation points that's written into your plan and that then allows you to once you've taken them consolidate immediately deploy the fresh reserve company headquarters and a couple of patrols going forward which tees you up for an immediate move through the existing team it, it presumably therefore it's more expensive if they try and i'm, I'm using a, a term if they try and consolidate somewhere that wasn't their phase line. yes i mean if we, again if we uh, take the example of our russian front scenario if for instance uh, the german uh, company on that side was getting nowhere it all gone pear-shaped and they're they've been completely um stymied then I might have to rely on uh, my other company, if you remember, that was deployed near, in the ravine advancing through. If they had made good progress, I could choose to consolidate with my reserve company in that area, right. but it costs me more orders. Right. So and that presumably means that it's, it's, it's reflecting the fact it's harder to do. Yes, that's right. And it also means, isn't it, by if I'm doing that, it means I can, uh, I've got less things to do in that turn as well. Yeah, and that, of course, is a really interesting mechanism because all of a sudden we're seeing phase line objectives being represented. We're mm -hmm. seeing then the ability for a company that has seized that uh, initial objective to go firm and C company to take up the attack from that point. And that, that mechanism is there, which means the application of reserves is is doing exactly what happens historically that's that's quite an unusual thing in a war game well hopefully you did ask me to come up with a couple of unique points so 
Oh, yeah. Uh, hopefully that. <laughs> that. I forgot my challenge. <laughs> Hold on, so, let's rewind. Dave, I asked you to come back with a couple of key challenge points. What have you done that's interesting in the rules? What would you name in this section as things that are different? Uh, consolidation. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Yes. I'd never thought of that, David. But you're right. It, it is a game mechanism I haven't seen before, but uh, it is a game mechanism that I have seen before in military circles where they're using a war game as, uh, as a training tool, where the fact that it is assumed that, you know, you because that is your phase line, you can consolidate on it and, yeah, and, and it, you can deploy reserves through it. And I've seen that in, in Kriegspiel. So that's bringing something that the military use into the hobby war game. But what I really like is that you're doing it in a way that isn't difficult. It's You're not having yeah. to have that huge plan. You mentioned consolidation points in the first video, and I'm thinking, okay, we need to talk about that. But that's perfectly clear now, and it's a really easy way to set your phase line objectives, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's obviously one of the uh, design concepts was to, uh, was simplicity, was to yeah. try and replicate what was in these manuals with a war game system that was relatively easy uh, to employ. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to touch on one extra aspect, mm -hmm. that consolidation and use of reserves brings, it also brings in the commander's decision about the timing of his reserves from both sides. So again, if you look at our Eastern Front scenario, it's when do I release two company? And when do I release the Panzers? And the Russians also got that decision. Does he, with his third company that he's held back in reserve, does he wait till I've consolidated and then try and reinforce his line? Or does he try to do something different? Perhaps he releases his reserve early, but then he'll know the opponents might still have a company in reserve. So it, it plays on the mind of the both attacker and the defender about the timing of when you release your reserve, because it uh, can be uh, literally a game changer. If you get it wrong and the opponent uh, over the next few turns, perhaps you deploy too early or too late, the opponent... Uh, could overwhelm you and win the game before you've you've deployed. Right. Okay. Fine. That's interesting. So that so you as the attacker will have phase lines that you're playing to, but the defender could also allocate consolidation points in in an area where he thinks I bet the enemy's going to come around my right flank, so I'll use that farm as my consolidation point because I'm kind of I've already told the. Uh, captain in charge of that company, you know, get get your men ready to make a move to to Oleg's farm because yes, yeah, uh, they have yeah. delicious potatoes, <laughs> or, you know, or or you know, we're expecting the enemy to be in that area. So you can do that, can you, as a defender? Yes, yeah, you can. So both the so the defender's um, consolidation point is actually called just a deployment area. You you again you make a note or, or just verbally note yeah. where you want your company to come on. Right. Uh, and again, you can change that, uh, obviously, if the battle develops in a different way, but it will cost you more orders to do so. All clear. OK, well, that's, that sounds really interesting. Um, <clears throat> the historian in me likes very much what you're saying because it, 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 it's, um, it's allowing us to reflect in a game what happens historically on the battlefield. The game designer in me likes it because... It's something new, but it's new and simple. It's not new mm. and complicated. So you're achieving a big, a big win result in, relatively easily in terms of that design principle. Uh, so that sounds really good stuff. Anything else we want to talk to on uh, talk about in terms of setting up and deploying forces, or do you think the next phase is going to be to talk about how command and control influences our arrival on the battlefield? You tell me, Dave. You're the yeah, I think, I think we've uh, segued, as they say, yeah. very nicely towards command and control now. Right, good. Well, thank you to everybody uh, for listening. Uh, Dave's going to be making us uh, a bit of a video looking into uh, how uh, this all uh, goes together. And we're going to be putting that on a large TV. We're going to be looking forward to going on to the next section, which is command and control, which is obviously something that is really important to me as a wargamer and a game designer. So hopefully we're going to have an interesting chat about that. 
but more importantly, give you, the listener, chapter and verse on exactly what to expect from the game, because I think uh, the great thing about what we're doing here is we're really giving, uh, really having the opportunity to forensically dissect <laughs> David's uh, new rules. But so there we are. Thank you very much, David, for joining me here on a large TV and thank you to everybody for listening in. Good night. Mm-hmm.